Hey everyone, my name's Andy. I'm from the Finding Value Finance channel. Uh, today we have with us Shabam. Hopefully I said that right. If I said it, you know, I, I was practicing a little bit, but um, not too good at pronouncing names. So welcome to the channel, Shabam. I really appreciate you coming on. Uh, I reached out to you through Twitter. Uh, if you guys want to follow Shabam and you like what uh, he says, I'd like to share his website or Twitter. So here's his Twitter account. Uh, you can find him at White Tundra SG. Uh, he also has a website, whitechandra.ca. Uh, I opened it up there. Uh, his website looks similar to this. He has uh, specific oil picks. He does have some price targets in here, given certain uh, oil price targets or, or prices. So he's got targets underneath it. Uh, you guys can obviously peruse whatever you'd like and uh, on the website and see what those targets are. And he also has some other stuff uh, linked up here. He's got a YouTube channel. What's the name of the, the channel? Uh, just under White Tundra Investments and all my uh, Zoom recordings will be on there um, as soon as they're uh, they're published. And I, I host Zooms every, every Sunday is sort of the plan right now. So every week uh, we do a little valuation seminar. We discuss three or four companies. We talk about their evaluation and then sort of insights as to what's going on their land acreage their well results their development plans their management uh, all sorts of uh, goodies if you will to really understand the companies yeah so he's got a lot uploaded here you should definitely check him out and um, check out his uh his website so got a question for you what's what's your background what what got you into oil uh what kind of background do you have in oil and what are you doing today yeah, you betcha. So uh, basically, it all started maybe when I was uh, only about a year old. Uh, we moved to Kuwait. Uh, my family moved to Kuwait, a big oil producer, as you know, um, and, and, and sort of just was exposed to, to oil and gas people around the family friends. Uh, my, my dad has worked in oil for about almost 30 years now, uh, if not more than that. And uh, just, just sort of it was just around me the whole time and then moved to Canada in 2006. Uh, Alberta, obviously a bigger, um, a big oil producer as well, almost uh, 5 million barrels a day there. And uh, it just was, was always in my blood that I, I wanted to go out and I wanted to explore for oil and, and really understand uh, what's, what's the driving force behind basically the world. Uh, ever since we discovered oil, uh, people's quality of lives and, and just their general living has, has grown so substantially. We've been able to sustain such a higher level of population uh, due to energy uh, and and oil in particular, so um, when I when it came time to sort of decide what I wanted to do as a career, um, went to the University of Alberta and they have the um, the only accredited petroleum engineering program in Canada. So I said, you know, this is really where I want to be. I want to learn from from the best of the best here, and uh, did that program, did my co-op program. So I worked in the field for about twenty months during my engineering uh, courses. And I, I always loved to be right at the wellhead. Basically every well, I wanted to operate it. I wanted to fix it. I wanted to really get to know these wells, how they produce, how, how they go wrong. What's the issues with them? How much oil can they really make? Uh, the drilling rigs, the service rigs, et cetera. Uh, so did that for a while. And then I graduated in 2018 and went back into the field and basically started my uh, White Tundra Resources which was a sort of a contract operation slash engineering firm and had just one client that I worked with. And again, I was working on site, uh, running about 30 wells, a couple of uh, water injection pumps and other just field equipment, which I just, I just started to love that. I, any time I spent in the Calgary offices was just like, I'm, I'm really not getting to know what's going on here uh, in reality. So, so did that for about uh, a year, then I moved to Grand Prairie, which is the, the big hub of oil and gas activity in the Montney uh, area recently in the last few years. Uh, continued my uh, white tundra resources and sort of just grew it from there. Got into chemical optimization, uh, well optimization, doing a lot of in-field studies around can we really extract more oil from these fields, uh, unconventional production. And then uh, March of 2021, I sort of left that went into full-time investing. The oil and gas equities had obviously done really well. Uh, I backed up the truck in March March to June of 2020 
as I think a lot of the, the oil and gas investors did. Um, so March 21, I left the patch uh, from a field level, moved full-time into investing, did some traveling around Mexico and the US. And uh, last September, I launched White Tundra Investments, which was sort of my foray into uh, running a sort of a private fund, really getting more involved with the management teams that I invested uh, with. So discussing with them what's going on, um, how are the wells doing, the development plans, their plans to play this cycle out, what they felt was sort of going on in the market. And uh, it's just grown grown substantially where now I, I present valuation sessions, uh, as mentioned, every Sunday, uh, used to be Saturdays, uh, discussing certain companies, uh, using a lot of software that we recently just have access to um, on, on really diving deep into these companies. Um, so that's sort of my one thing. I discuss macro outlook sessions every quarter. So we do sort of supply demand inventories, every country, every area of the market uh, and every sort of product and then crude. Uh, we talk renewables, we talk the economy, we talk uh, EVs, sort of everything that, that comes with the oil and gas macro outlook presentation. Um, and then also recently we've been getting more involved in the sort of the private placement junior oil space. So it's, it's sort of a upcoming theme in every, in every oil and gas cycle, if you will. And this time is a little bit different because most people just don't care. They don't want to invest in oil. So the opportunities uh, that we're getting is, is, is a lot better than we had access to in the past. So just growing that. And we have some really, really cool new dashboards coming up to support the retail investor. Uh, I think the retail investor has been scared of oil for very long because they always think they're getting scammed with how opaque these companies are. So just really trying to bring the, the real data back uh, into that. Well, that's great. That's a great background. Uh, I like talking to other investors. Uh, I think if you basically can get away from the uh, nine to five job or eight to four, whatever you want to call it, eight to five job and uh, make it on your own through investing, I definitely want to hear, you know, your, your experiences and stuff like that from, from other investors. So that's what, those are the people I really try to reach out and get on the channel. So where do we see ourselves right now in terms of the oil markets, in terms of pricing, inventories, and stuff like that? What, what, what's your take on inventory levels and, and the pricing? Yeah, you bet. So sort of the whole thesis ever since we had the COVID lows was that, look, we going into 2020, we were sort of coming into the end of U.S. shale supply where the shale had, had been the big driver of oil supply growth uh, for, for sort, of, sort of since 2014, you can say. And it was sort of plateauing out. We saw the rig count start to decline. We saw well productivity start to decline. And um, as soon as COVID hit, it was like, oh, here we go. Like if the demand really does come back to where we were, um, where, where this is not like a catastrophic uh, disease that kills billions of people, we are going to head into a very, very undersupplied uh, oil market going forward. And the thesis held all the way until probably till March or April of this year, where we were drawing crude inventories by roughly a million barrels a day. And then we were drawing uh, product inventories. So your gasolines, diesels, jet fuels combined by about a million barrels a day. And we were running through all this excess uh, savings account, if you will, uh, to the point where the market was getting really, really tight at the beginning of this year. And we thought, okay, well, here we go. Here's the big, big rocket ships, uh, lots of money to be made. The price of crude was kind of in that 80, 90, 95 range. It was heading there. And then we had multiple things happen at the same time. We had the Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, obviously, which was a big, big sort of change uh, in supply demand there. Uh, no one all of a sudden knew what was happening with these Russian barrels. But at the same time, one of the biggest growth drivers of demand, which was China, just went into complete lockdown after the Olympics. Uh, we had demand drop by maybe two to three million barrels a day. Their COVID zero policy was absolutely aggressive. Some of the videos and pictures coming out were, were basically unbelievable um, to, the, to the extent that people were wondering if, if they were even real or not. Um, so we had that. We went through sort of a lull in the market, April to June. Um, the, the tightness was really being priced in. People were saying, look, Russian barrels are going to be completely wiped off the market. 
Um, but at the, same, at the same time, the Chinese demand was, was sort of eating that up uh, to a point where we, we hit that $180 a barrel when we talk about crude plus crack spread uh, because of the refining, refining issues we had throughout the year, um, which brought on a lot of demand destruction to go with it. And therefore the, the market sort of fell into a balance again from this undersupply that it had been in. And in the meantime, we saw that A, Russian barrels never left the market. They were finding ways, whether it's through Latvia, through Kazakhstan, through Saudi, through a sanctioned ships to ship these barrels out. And we saw China just relentless. They just did not want to back down on their COVID zero policies. So the market obviously just sort of eased off a bit. And at the same time, the Biden administration came in and said, look, we're going to have the biggest SPR release ever. Uh, it's a national emergency is what they claim it was. And they dumped, uh, or they are currently dumping 180 million barrels on the market, along with that 60 million additional barrels from US allies is being absorbed by the market. Um, so we add all these factors up. We have Chinese, the second Chinese lockdown in Chengdu and Shenzhen in early September. It all sort of brought the market to a, a very short oversupply regime uh, where we saw inventory start to build again um, and, and the market just sort of start, start to tank there. We saw the crack spreads um, becoming lower and lower. We saw the price of crude becoming lower and the market was sort of wondering, okay, where do we sort of go from here? We, we don't really know what's going on. Uh, at the same time, a lot of paper traders left the market, increased volatility. When there's less trading, there's more volatility. It's easy to push the price up or down um, both ways. So that's sort of where we were about, about two to three weeks ago, where people were sort of wondering, okay, is this oil bull market over already? Um, and then we saw something change in the last sort of two to three weeks where A, China has ramped up significantly, not only domestically, but road travel and airline travel outside of China. For the first time since probably COVID first started, we see destinations like Singapore, Macau, Thailand, that are big Chinese travel destinations start to ramp up their, their uh, domestic um, travel coming into these countries. So that's one factor. The second factor is Russian barrels have started to come off the market. It's very easy to operate wells in the summertime. From my experience, you can operate wells, no problem. It's when the winter hits that you really start to struggle especially with the service companies no longer in Russia, some of them anyways, um, as we saw these temperatures go into that zero to 10 degrees Celsius range, now going into the zero and into the minuses, Russian production is really being impacted. So you take these two factors and we're now back into where we see the market going into this undersupply again, especially as the US SPR is, is coming close to an end. They've released about 150 million barrels this year already. There's about 60 million to go. Um, politically, uh, it's it sort of takes them into the midterm elections. Um, and we'll see what they do after that. They, the SPR has been drained, yes. Can they drain it further? Yes. But people are going to step in and say, look, you have to stop draining the barrels. We need this for the military. We need this for hurricanes. We need this for our allies in, in case of any other supply disruptions. Um, so there's going to be political pressure both ways uh, going forward. And that's sort of where we sit today. A lot of people have said, look, we just don't know what's going on. We're going to leave the market. We have no idea where this is going, so they don't want to bet on it. Um, but with the recent kind of drawdown in the price of oil, you see that the, the backwardation has gotten larger, uh, which is telling us that the physical market is, is sort of getting tighter as China reopens. Um, and the risk reward where we are today, from my perspective, is, is probably as strong as it has ever been. Um, so that's how, that's how white tundra is positioned anyway, uh, going into the future. So you would say that we're kind of in a, a pretty balanced market, right? Where we're at, uh, you commented on crack spreads, crack spreads, just so everybody knows is the refining, right? You've got the, the, the cost of oil and then the cost of refining and how tight that refining gets. And we got to gasoline prices that were five, $6, depending on where you're at, uh, located in the United States, at least. Uh, and that crack spread was actually a large portion of that gasoline price. 
uh, it, at least historically, uh, compared to historically. Um, we could see it where oil drives more of that gasoline price than the actual tightness in the crack spreads. And that, I think, would happen uh, if we can't produce more than a certain amount, because then refiners will be fighting for oil instead of us, you know, I'll say instead of the oil fighting for refineries. So um, I just wanted to clarify that so, since everybody's listening and they may not know what that means. Uh, so looking forward, we've got, I would say, a, a somewhat balanced market where we're at today. We've got demand kind of opening up from China. Where do you see us going forward six months, year or something like that? Do you see the market tightening? Do you see it loosening up? Uh, if the SPR barrels come off the market, do we get really tight? Uh, what what does that look like in your uh, you know in your opinion? Yeah, you betcha. So you know that's probably the the billion dollar question that that everybody here is asking. And the way I I like to explain this is is to sort of go back and and reverse engineer the answer. And what I mean by that is is if you look at previous recessions, does demand drop off? Yes, demand drops off by roughly in 2008, it dropped off at its max about two to two and a half, maybe up to 3 million barrels a day. So that's sort of a, the, the number that we have uh, as, our, as our sort of baseline in that sort of crisis. Um, so, okay. However, where should demand be? If we look at any previous recession, when, when the recessionary forces end, we don't just go back into our original, like not original, I should say, we don't just go back to sort of gaining that million barrels a day of world demand from the recessionary point. We actually catch up to where we were pre-recession and on that million, 1.5 million barrels a day of demand growth year over year from that point onwards. So if we say that pre-COVID, we were at about 100 million barrels a day of demand, which is where we are today, um, you might say, okay, well, if we have a recession of 2 million barrels a day, we actually end up in a, in a very oversupplied market and the price of oil is gonna crater. And that's what a lot of people are using as sort of their base case. But demand didn't just stop. If we look at demand numbers from, from sort of compared to pre-COVID and we look at air travel in countries like Canada, we look at air travel in countries like Mexico, even some European countries, uh, our emerging markets like Colombia, which are sort of the big drivers of growth, we're running 20 to 30 to 40% above pre-COVID levels already. When we look at road travel, it's sort of the same thing. You look at some of the Middle Eastern countries, you look at Brazil, uh, you look at some of the European countries, despite the talk about Europe collapsing, our road travel is still running above pre-COVID levels. So what does that tell you? That tells you there's sort of a dislocation in the market where certain areas have rebounded, certain areas are above pre-COVID demand, and then certain areas are still below pre-COVID demand, most of that being in China and some of the countries around China, such as Thailand, uh, Singapore, Malaysia, uh, Macau, some of these big, big drivers, we just have not had the, 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 the economy restart that they required. So now let's, let's go back to our kind of our reverse engineering calculation. If we were at 100 million barrels a day pre-COVID, demand was growing at 1 to 1.5 million barrels a day per year. We're now three years into, into COVID, almost, two and a half, three years. So our world oil demand should be somewhere between 103 and 104.5 million barrels a day using that same trend line. And we're not there yet. So take that 103 to 104.5, subtract your 2 million barrels in an in a absolutely GFC type recession, we still end up at 101 to 102.5 million barrels a day of demand. We're right now, as we speak, at roughly at 100. So even if you bake in that this recession is coming or it's already here, we still have about one to two million barrels a day of demand to grow from here to get back to our sort of pre-COVID recession trend line. And that's sort of the thesis that really makes this such an opportunity is that even if you have that sort of recession, our oil demand actually still continues going up at a time when supply is just not there. The SPR is adding, like you said, about 750 to a million barrels a day into commercial inventories. And uh, commercial inventories being the inventories that are actually being used right now, that are out in the open market available to purchase. 
what our WTI and Brent sort of prices off of those commercial inventories. So if we look about two months ahead of us, we see A, the SPR is ending. So you have that 750 to million that no longer is in commercial inventory. And B, we see this demand possibly coming back up one to 2 million barrels a day in the next two months. And when you run the numbers that way, we're gonna be one to two to 3 million barrels a day undersupplied in the next mm -hmm. two months from a commercial inventory standpoint. And that's where you can see that, okay, if I agree that there's gonna be a recession, we lose that 2 million barrels a day of oil demand we still end up in a massively undersupplied scenario as long as two things, as long as China reopens and China allows for international travel, which allows these other economies re to reopen, uh, which is sort of what we're seeing. China recently announced they're, they're starting uh, international travel into Macau, which has been a completely dead uh, casino destination since COVID. So uh, those two things happen. And of course the big uh, bang on the side which could be is if Russian barrels start to come off the market. If you see Russian barrels drop by half a million to a million barrels to 2 million in the next two to three months, that, that's just going to bring on a new era here where people are going to ca get caught completely off guard. Uh, you could have an absolutely collapsing economy, a collapsing world, a sort of recession. You could have people really saving their money and yet oil prices continue higher. Um, the The sort of Russian barrels off the market is your is your big X factor that we don't really have clear evidence as to what's going on. But so far, I'm seeing Russian barrels have dropped off by about half a million barrels a month, month over month already. And I don't see this anywhere within the news sources. I think they themselves want to be 100% sure uh, before they, they start posting stuff like this, because it's, it's a big shift uh, in oil supply demand going forward. Um, and, that's sort of the, again, that all comes back down to the thesis that, that we've been running with, um, that, that no matter, even if you have a worldwide recession, oil is just so undersupplied from a supply demand perspective, you can't bring the market back into balance once China reopens. Um, so uh, long answer to your very uh, short question. Here's, here's another question that I have. I know we're talking uh, supply demand balance and you know the intersection at, at inventories. Um, a lot of that growth looking backwards was from uh, shale oil, correct? The majority of growth came from North American shale oil. Correct. Do you think that there's still some more to tap out of the shale oil in terms of production growth? Or do you think we are in a decline for the shale oil in America? You bet. So I think this is where things things get a little bit interesting depending on the, depending on the way you want to talk about it. So when people say that shale is in decline, they're not saying that shale production itself is going to decline. They're saying that the growth is going to decline. So shale added roughly 2 million barrels in 2018, 2 million barrels a day in 2018. In 2019, it added another million barrels a day. And it was really, like you mentioned, the big growth driver in terms of supply. And people just said, oh, shale, if it can add 2 million barrels a day, if it can add 1 million barrels a day, it can keep on this trend for another five years. But what we saw happening was a sort of a multitude of things happening at the same time. One, well productivity started to drop. So a lot of shale producers were obviously drilling their best acreage and they had the tier one stuff that they eventually started to run out of. Um, and we saw well productivity start to drop. B, decline rates. Shale wells declined roughly 60, 70, 80% in their first year. So what you saw happening was when shale was only producing 2 million barrels a day, it's easy to add another million because your, your 2 million, if you, if you put a 60% decline on it, declines by 1.2 million. So if you want to grow a million barrels a day, you got to first offset your declines of 1.2, and then you've got to grow 1 million. So 2.2 of new production, easy. When shale is now at 5 million, now you put a 60% decline on that. So if you want to grow a million, you got to now offset 3 million of decline plus add your million. So 4 million of new production. And when you think about it from that perspective, you sort of see why there's a problem here. It's not that shale can't add that 4 million. It's that, that adding that 4 million results in less and less growth every year. So 
that's sort of where we're at today. I think shale so far this year is probably up somewhere between two to 500,000 barrels a day. The numbers are very muddy because the Gulf of Mexico has been adding a lot of barrels this year. And then American conventional oil has had a resurgence as producers who shut in wells since 2014 are now bringing them back online. So call it two to 500 K this year. Next year, they might add another two to 500,000 barrels. It's just not enough. It's not enough because the world needs shale. It expects shale and it's sort of baked in a million barrels a day of shale growth to their models. You look at the models that um, any sort of bank is running. You look at the models that Rystad is running, that um, McKinsey is running. You look at the models that City Citigroup is running, a big bearish oil a news agency is running. They're all saying shale will add one plus million barrels a day this year and next year and in 2024. And that's where the entire models kind of starts to fall apart um, because it's just not true, especially when you add in that well productivity continues to decline every month, every year. Uh, so you need more rigs to do the same, same amount of new production. And the third factor here is just a lack of labor, a lack of rigs, a lack of steel, a lack of parts. So even if you had a new company and you said, here's $500 million, drill, baby, drill, they can't do it because you can't find the rigs and you can't find your casing and your tubing and your pumps and your well site engines and your little pieces that you need in order for the well to function. And if they can't find it, they're paying 100% extra on steel. They're paying 200% extra on certain parts of the kind of oil tubular goods, a part of the equation. They're paying 40 to 50% more for unskilled labor who now you have to train and they're making mistakes, they're having incidents, wells are not getting drilled properly, um, et cetera. So it's, it's sort of like everything went wrong at the same time, um, but hey, kudos to, to Shale and how good the acreage is that they're actually maintaining production and, and still growing to some extent. Um, but the days of a million barrels a day growth per year are gone and the market doesn't believe it. The Biden administration doesn't believe it in their SPR release uh, note. They specifically said shale will add a million barrels a day by the time the SPR ends. They haven't even had added 500,000. I would say maybe 250,000 uh, in those six months, five months so far. So when that bubble uh, bursts, when the forecasts start getting to be lowered and lowered and lowered, when the people really believe this is I think when the market really starts to think, okay, there's a problem here. But until the world believes that Shell can add it, they just think, oh, well, if it's a 3 million barrel a day under supply, well, Shell can add 3 million. So why are you panicking? Why are you uh, saying all these things? So, uh, so, so great point to bring up. I think Shale, the fact that Shale cannot grow that is a big, big factor that the market hasn't priced in yet, which is a reason why the opportunity that that's sort of in front of us, uh, despite some of these equities going up 10 X in the last two years, the opportunity is still so, so strong and why we remain invested uh, in the sector. So here, here's another question I have. So if the majority of the growth came from shale and then we look forward, where do you think that growth is going to come from then? Yeah, great, great question. So. <laughs> There's sort of two factors to this that I like to talk about. Uh, one would be because shale oil came online and it sort of cratered the market since 2014, your conventional cycle of oil goes high for, for five years and then oil goes low for five years is no longer going to be true. Why? Because what happened in the past was when we saw oil prices go higher, conventional long lead projects like the Gulf of Mexico, like your offshore Guyana, like your Canadian oil sands, like your Iraqi Kazakh production, it takes about three to five years to come online. And what you what you saw happening was prices went high, projects got FID'd, meaning final investment decisions made. And we saw three to five years down the road, supply came online, prices fell back down because too much supply came online. Naturally, that's the human nature. They just, everybody trips over themselves to produce this high high price barrel, um, 
and you had these five year cycles. It's been going on for a hundred years. Um, but since shale came online, conventional production, conventional exploration, and new projects have completely stopped. So the last projects that got sanctioned in, in 2013, 2014, um, came online in sort of that 2017, 2018 range. Uh, some of them would be kind of your Kazakh, uh, Kashagan field, um, some of the Canadian old sands productions that came online in 17, 18, 19. And since then, there's nothing. There's nothing coming online. So uh, when people say that this cycle is going to be a lot longer, that's sort of one of the reasons for it is that a we don't have that steady drip of conventional supply coming online and so why is that important because you asked a great question where is the supply going to come from it's not shale shale being unconventional short-term production we now are looking for conventional long leaf projects and oil prices have been above call it 90 dollars a barrel for six months this year did we see any reports of conventional production? No, nothing, zero. And it's it's sort of driving the question is not the question is not where the oil is going to come from. That's a great question to begin with. The the, the production is going to come from conventional long lead projects. In OPEC, uh, in Russia, it was supposed to, no longer the case. In the Canadian oil sands, in maybe some of the uh, shut out regimes like Venezuela and Iran. That's where the production is going to come from. But when is it going to come online? That's the question that nobody has the answer to. It's, it's like nobody wants to invest in these supply projects unless the price of oil is above $100 a barrel for like 6 to 12 to 18 to 24 months, A, and B, until the equities of these companies reflect enough of a valuation to justify them going and saying to the shareholders, look, our, our stocks are trading at 10 times cash flow. We're trading at six to eight times free cash flow. It no longer makes sense to buy back our shares. We have a hefty dividend already. So we're going to go and invest in new projects. Until those two things hold true, you're likely going to see very, very little new, new projects a new supply come online and and possibly kind of a double whammy on what makes this trade so interesting is that a you get the price of oil benefit as an investor in these equities so so as the prices of, of oil goes higher the companies make more money which comes back to you in share buybacks and dividends in mergers and acquisitions um, and possibly in production growth to some extent very very low extent um, and B, you get the benefit of the equities themselves. They have to re-rate before you get production growth. And if the market's not gonna re-rate them, the companies themselves will. How? By paying a 20 to 25% dividend or buying back 10, 15, 20, 25% of their floats every year. And eventually the companies will re-rate to where it doesn't make sense to do that, to, to, uh, do that anymore. And then we start investing in new projects and then remember, it's a three to five to seven year cycle before those projects come online. And it could be even longer now because of the supply chain issues that I mentioned. Uh, if you can't find petroleum engineers, if you can't find geologists, if you can't find pipeline labor, if you can't find welders, if you can't find the steel, it doesn't matter how much money you throw at the problem. You're not gonna, you're not gonna fix the problem with money. You need real people and real uh, labor to go and do that. This is not the uh, this is not the metaverse or a video game where you press X Y Z and you got an offshore rig, active drilling well uh, drilling for oil. Uh, unfortunately, the real world doesn't work uh, doesn't work that way. <laughs> so when you, you keep referring to um, shortages of we'll say parts, shortages of rigs and stuff like that, uh, do you believe that's going to get worse going into the future? Are you seeing it getting worse? Um, I think naturally it has to get worse. And, and there's, there's a couple of reasons for that. For the last 10 to 15 years, the younger generation has been told that oil is dead and oil is a big polluter. We're no longer going to need oil. So don't even bother going into oil. Why, why would you go into oil, right? Let's, let's go into tech. Let's go into IT. Let's go into software, uh, renewables. 
which is all fair. You know, the world is headed that way, yes. But the mistake that's been made is they figured it's going to happen a lot faster than it actually will. We still consume 100 million barrels of oil every single day. And it it's not recyclable. It goes poof into thin air, uh, literally. So I think the transition has been almost forced to a point where it's no longer even socially acceptable to say you're, you're invested in oil companies or you're uh, a petroleum engineer. It's like a big, oh, look at you, you're a, you're a polluter, you're killing you know, the, the animals and all this. And it's just too bad it's gone that way. Um, so, so that's one reason for the shortage. The second reason is if we look back 15 years, there's been three major hits that the oil and gas employment has taken, 2008, 2014, and then 2020. So after those hits, a lot of people just said, screw this, I'm not, I don't care for the, for the short-term higher money. I want stability. I got kids, I got bills to pay, I got vehicles, I got houses, mortgages. So I'd rather make less money in something that's more stable. And they're not coming back. You, you can't pay them enough right now to say, oh, look, you should come back and work in the oil field again. And they say, uh, no, buzz off. So, um, you know, and, and even if they, they wanted to work there, I think their family and their kids would say, no, like we saw what happened with this. As soon as the price drops, they just throw you out, you know, like a, like a bag of garbage kind of thing. Um, so, so there's that. And then the third factor was a lot of the older generation. So people who started their careers in the oil patch, let's say in the eighties and the nineties, they went to Iraq, they went to Saudi Arabia, they went to Malaysia. They did all these expat jobs and, and gigs. They're retiring. They said, we don't want to do this anymore. We made a lot of money in our oil stocks. We made a lot of money during our heydays. Uh, we're now, you know, in our fifties and our sixties, and we just don't care anymore. We, you know, we're just going to enjoy our retirement. And, you know, to be honest with you, the new generation is just not built that way. A lot of people can't even be convinced to go to an office and work, let alone if you tell them you got to work 30 days on an offshore rig with 20 foot waves. And, you know, we don't know if you got to work 24 hours in a day. We don't know if you might have to stay for 60 days on this rig. We don't know if you, if we have your, you know, Wi-Fi connection on these, on these rigs. A lot of people just say, what? Like, no, there's no way you're, you're going to convince me to do that. So it's just a reality we live in. I'm not trying to bash anyone. Uh, it is what it is. And the industry just has not adapted. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, now they say, oh, well, we can just pay them more. And it's not, it's not solving the problem. The, the money is not the concern here. It's, it's the stability. It's the social sort of issue of, of being involved with oil. It's the fact that you got to train people to do jobs that are high risk, high danger jobs. Um, and and the, the generation is just not interested in, in these sorts of jobs, in the amounts of people that we require. Like, can you, can you fill 10, 20, 30, 50% of the openings over time? Yes. With enough money? Yes. But not to the extent we need to really scale, um, scale the amount of production that we need especially with, with these shale wells. I mean, you need way more rigs, way more parts, you know, way more labor on this treadmill, if you will, uh, to keep these production volumes online. And uh, so far, I'm not seeing any sort of easing up off it. I've, I've got people approaching me and saying, eh, hey, you know, can you work? You can even work remotely. Uh, we can do this. We can fly you in. We can do this and that. And I just said, no, I just, I just don't care enough. I, I don't think, you know, as much as I, I really loved working in the industry, I really care. I'm, I'm, I'm passionate about the oil uh, wells. It's just, it's just easier for me to make money by investing in these wells rather than going out there working three, four, 500 hour months, being on call 24 seven, not being able to attend weddings, not being able to attend birthdays, you know, missing Christmas. I think uh, that's just a no go zone for, for a lot of people these days. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's sort of where we are today. Here, here's another question. And I don't know if you follow this or not. <clears throat> it's what matters is, I mean, as, as countries grow, they consume their own production. 
What's left over is usually things that they export. Do you watch the exportable oil? Is it shrinking as economies start to continue to grow? You know, Saudi Arabia has grown. I know they're consuming their um, their production and then exporting less maybe over time. Are we seeing that worldwide? Are we exporting, not we as the United States, but just in general, are we going to get a squeeze of exported oil at some point? Uh, like absolutely fantastic comment. I think, and and one of the things that I still haven't really even discussed is, is the fact that if you look at the last 20 years, nobody has any clue how much oil demand has grown in, in you know, remote countries like, like when, let's say Peru, let's use Peru in this, as an example. If you ask somebody, I'll give you a bazillion dollars to tell me what exactly was the oil demand in Peru for the last 20 years, you could not get an accurate answer because there's so much oil that just slips through the cracks. It gets tapped out of pipelines. It gets sold and nobody knows about it. It gets consumed in remote villages. It's just unknown. And for the last 20 to 40 to 60 years, it just did not matter. It was just a, such a small part on the margins that nobody really cared. It's like, okay, well, it got produced and consumed. Well, whatever. But these countries, as you mentioned, are becoming a larger portion, not just of oil demand, but of oil demand growth. And oil is always priced on the margin. It's, it's a last barrel that's being sold that tells you what the price is on the market. So as these countries consume more, as they become larger growth factors, keep in mind, when somebody moves from riding a bicycle to now driving a motor, motorbike, their energy consumption just went up a, like an infinite percentage, right? Mm -hmm. So as more people move into this S curve, as we call it, um, what ends up happening is the the market can only figure out what this demand is by looking at exports. You subtract your production minus sort of your, your internal demand and you get your export number. So this is true of not just oil, but in oil and natural gas, you're seeing a lot of the developing economies, they, A, their production is dropping because it's conventional oil that was first produced 40, 50, 60, 70 years ago but also their consumption starts rocketing up by five, six, seven, ten percent 10% a year. You know, countries like Saudi Arabia, their, their GDP is growing at 10% a year. Um, Iran, you know, people have no idea how much oil Iran is consuming at all. So they come out and say, oh, if the sanctions were raised, this much oil could go on the market. Well, Iranian domestic consumption could have gone up two, three, 400,000 barrels a day since 2014. You don't know that it didn't. And it most likely did when we look at natural gas consumption trends. So you're absolutely right. There's, there's sort of a secondary issue here where countries that, that previously used to export a lot of oil, um, I'm talking Colombia, I'm talking Mexico, I'm talking some of your OPEC countries, uh, some of your countries like even Nigeria, for example. Nigeria is, is set up to have one of the biggest population growth over the next 10 to 20 years compared to the, re the rest of the world. And guess what? Nigerian production is falling right off a cliff. So, uh, you know, this factor is very, very important, I think, going forward. And we have very opaque data. We have very bad data uh, supporting these things. So what do we look for? We look for exports. How much are they actually exporting? And exports are dropping in some of these countries materially um, and, 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 the sort of the the uh, icing on the cake is that as they sell more and more oil at higher prices, their economy itself gets a supercharger on it. So the more money that flows into their domestic coffers, the more they subsidize their energy consumption, the more that people get richer and want a higher quality of life. You might see some eye popping GDP numbers if if we get into a, a higher oil price for longer regime. You you might go and see, wow, this, this country grew its oil consumption at 10, 15, 20% a year, like just eye-popping numbers. Uh, we're not there yet, but it's another sort of bullish case uh, going forward because at $60 a barrel oil, all the money's lost 
within operating transportation, drilling, construction, et cetera, at $100 per barrel oil. There's a lot of excess on the side. And um, as I mentioned, a lot of these countries subsidize their energy consumption. So it doesn't matter what the price of oil is. The consumer in these countries, such as Kuwait, pays that same, call it 30, 40 cents a gallon. So they don't care. They'll go out and start buying all kinds of vehicles and consuming, doing ATV rides and desert safaris and all sorts of other stuff. So uh, great point. I, I don't see that get brought up very often. So uh, definitely uh, appreciate you bringing that up. Yeah. So as investors, what I look for, I'm looking you know, ahead. Where is the exportable oil? Where are the reserves? Because those are the two that I look for. I look, where's the reserves and where, what country can export? Because if we get an export pinch where countries start becoming wealthier off their oil, they start exporting less, uh, the people who do want that oil are going to start bidding after whatever is left export-wise. So in your opinion, you know, is this a good way to play it? Should you be, where should you be looking for? What countries do you like? Um, kind of how are you playing all of this, we'll call it oil bull market? Yeah, for sure. So I think you make an excellent point that that the price is really on the margins. So you want to look at that last barrel that people are bidding for and what they're willing to bid on it. So um, it's it sort of ties back to what I talked about with commercial inventories, because when you release so much SPR, strategic petroleum reserves, you're not letting the market find its right balance from a commercial inventory standpoint. So you keep providing oil to this bidder, this last bidder from the reserves. So they don't have to go out in the market and bid on this oil. So you are not allowing for price discovery in its sort of its, its raw natural state. And sort of why we think that the SPR is really clouded the market, not just from a barrels on the market sort of volume perspective, but just you're not allowing for the price discovery to happen. Um, so, so that's sort of the first point. The second point that, that sort of uh, ties back to your question is what am I tracking? So we look at countries where supply is going down. Um, basically every OPEC country, we see supply going down. Every conventional oil producer uh, supply is going down. Uh, Mexico, Nigeria, you know, being some of the big ones, the Congo, um, Saudi Arabia itself is sort of flatlining at that 11 million barrels a day uh, top mark. Uh, we see Russia obviously coming off the market. Uh, we see sort of in the Middle East, your big growth drivers now from the other side would be the UAE has still spare capacity left. Um, they have offshore fields that they're tapping into. Uh, we see Iraq as sort of being in the mid ground where they're suffering from a lot of declines, but they also have new fields, uh, the Majnoon field being a big one that can be brought online. Uh, we see Kuwait as a big, big decline in production. Their Burgan field has just fallen off a cliff. Uh, they've lost maybe half a million barrels a day in the last three years, which is call it a almost a 20% decline in oil production in just three years. And they're unable to sort of bring that back up using enhanced oil recovery techniques. More and more countries falling into this uh, issue. And then, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of small producers that add up. So we look at India, we look at Malaysia, we look at the uh, Equatorial Guinea, we look at Colombia, uh, you know, Argentina, maybe they're growing their shale production, so it doesn't count. But countries like this, when you add them all up, you see that they're every year declining by three to four to five to six percent. And you add them up, it's maybe 10 to 12 to 15 million barrels a day, declining at four to five, six percent every year for the last seven to eight to 10 years. It's a trend that just continues. So Conventional oil is declining. There are certain countries that can keep it flat. And then there, you have your growth factors. The biggest one right now is Guyana. You're seeing Guyana add, call it 150 to 200,000 barrels a year um, for the next two to three to five years. Uh, we see Argentina being 
possibly a factor with its Vaca Amorte shale play. Um, Exxon, I believe, is a big, big player in there. Some of the uh, multinational companies are really looking at Argentinian shale, um, Colombian shale as well. And then we have Brazilian production, which has sort of stagnated, but it can grow under the right sort of pricing and enough capitalization put into it. Uh, so it's sort of a very, very, very wide mix. And what I like to do is in my uh, quarterly macro outlook seminars, I go country by country and I discuss where are they, where have they been and where are they going? When we look at it from a country by country perspective, you end up in the same sort of conclusion that there is no supply that can be brought online. When you look at the declines, you look at the new production being brought online, you add in the American shale production and maybe a little bit of growth out of Canada. You know, Canada seems to be growing, call it 150, 200,000 barrels a year. You add all that up, you're not getting any extra supply on the market. It's all going <clears throat> towards mitigating worldwide conventional oil declines. So, um, you know, there's, we can definitely go much, much deeper into this. And I have a macro session coming up on October 30th, where I once again will go country by country look at the latest sort of what's happening there. Um, and, and basically the only growth right now, as I mentioned, is coming out of Guyana, uh, maybe a little bit of an, out of Iraq. And then the UAE has possibly half a million barrels a day or more in its spare capacity, meaning fields that can be brought online within three months, uh, but they just can't right now because of the way the OPEC plus agreement is. So those are your big factors right now. If we look into the future, uh, Iran, uh, Iran, obviously, if the sanctions come off, can add somewhere between a million barrels a day within a year, 18 months time frame. Uh, Venezuela is basically a gone case. Uh, it's going to take in the hundreds of billions of dollars, along with a significant repair in sort of political relations to see any sort of extra barrels come out of Venezuela. And it's going to be in the two to three to five year range. It's not going to be right away. And then you have the Canadian oil sands. The Canadian oil sands is basically the largest reserve that still sits out there untapped. Uh, are they going to grow if you beg and plead them to? Probably not. They, the companies that are operating there just don't care. They've been, they've been beat up and they've been taxed and They've been called all sorts of names for so, so long that they just don't care anymore. They, they don't care if the world goes to a hell in a handbasket. They could not care less. So what's it going to take? It's going to take sustained pricing above $100 a barrel. We don't need to get to 150. We need sustained pricing. We need stability more than we need excessive pricing. So something to keep in mind, we need Sustained pricing and what has the SPR release done and the Biden administration done? Increased volatility and they brought the price back down below $80 a barrel. So your 12 month sustained pricing has just been reset. That's just the nature of the beast. Um, and, and what else is it gonna take? It's gonna take the company's equities, again, reflecting those higher multiples for them to justify investing dollars back in the ground and any oil sands projects today, I can guarantee you, is going to cost 30, 40, 50, 70% higher than it did in the 2010 to 14 range. So you put that back into your model and you say, well, it's gonna be maybe 2027, 2028, by the time you can get any sort of production back online, that's gonna materially impact this, this uh, thesis. And in the meantime, um, the companies are gonna make a lot of money and they are very happy to just distribute it back to the shareholders and do their sustaining projects, keep their production flat and just leave things be. So, um, you know, looking past this SPR release is when things get really, really interesting. Uh, especially if you think China is ramping up. I think um, you're, you're really, there's no place here where any supply can, can come online to meet that demand, which means what do you need to get to? You need to get to a price in crude plus crack spreads that starts destroying demand. And we saw that price to be roughly $180 a barrel 
crude plus crack. Let's knock 20 off that. Uh, 160 crack spreads right now in, are in the 35 to 40 dollar range. That gives you a crude price of somewhere between 120 and 130 dollars a barrel. I think many oil investors will be very very happy with that. Um, we don't need 150. We don't need 200. Let's let's get that point straight. We don't we don't need any sort of you know egregious amounts of 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 oil pricing. We need 110, 105, 115, 120. And these companies are minting so much money. Um, you almost got to wonder there's something wrong with the way the stocks are being priced um, at those at those sorts of levels. Mm -hmm. So speaking about stocks, what uh, what companies do you like? What um, where are they located? What what where? Are, how are you kind of positioning yourself for all this? Yeah, you bet. Uh, excellent question. So there's there's two there's two sorts of companies that I'm really a fan of right now in the small to mid cap space. One would be your conventional low decline producers. So there's a lot of conventional oil in Canada that still remains untapped. Why? Because it just has not been capitalized. When we look at technologies like horizontal drilling, multi-leg drilling, water flooding, CO2 injection, uh, CO2 enhanced oil recovery, none of these projects got funded since 2014 because all the money went to oil sands or it went to shale. So a lot of these projects got left unfunded. Nobody wanted to fund them at $60, $70 oil that we saw since 2014. Nobody wanted to fund any of this. They just kept production flat and kept things going. And now these companies are coming out and saying, look, we have all this undeveloped land that is not in our reserve reports. Why? Because you can't claim reserves unless you have, you've actually drilled on that land and proven there's oil there. But we know from geologic mapping, from 3D seismic, from competitor activity, that there is oil in these areas. It just hasn't been drilled. So you're seeing companies with absolutely massive acreage and potential reserves that are going to be slowly accounted for um, that are now capitalizing these projects and bringing wells online. They're finding some really, really juicy targets which never got discovered because it never got capitalized. So one of my sort of favorite plays with, with this is um, Surge Energy, my biggest holding. They have two uh, conventional oil plays, one in the Sparky area where they are the biggest holder of land. They are the biggest producer. And then they have your Southeast Saskatchewan Frobisher wells, which are some of the most economic wells in North America, uh, very, very cheap to drill. You know, both the Sparky and the Frobishers are under $2 million in that $1.5 million range. Compare that to a Permian well that costs nine to $10 million Canadian, or your Montney slash Duvernay wells, which cost upwards of $13 million a well. Um, just because of how long these wells are, how much fracking they require. Um, the other thing with conventional oil wells, they don't need fracking. So you don't need any fresh water, you don't need as much casing. You don't need as much tubing. Uh, you don't, you're not subject to frac sand costs, a uh, diesel cost when you're pumping equipment. So less affected by inflation. Um, so, so that's sort of the first producer we look at. Um, Surge is not the only one. There's other companies that do similar uh, sorts of uh, activity. You have your white caps, you have your crescent points, you have your obsidian energy, a company I really, really like uh, that's really using this multi-leg uh, horizontal drilling in the clear water and the blue sky plays. So big fan of that. The second uh, sort of sector that I really like these days is the unconventional Montney, but the undeveloped part of it. So when we compare Canadian shale plays to the American shale plays, the Canadian shale plays are roughly five to seven years behind. So when I said the Permian grew substantially with tier one acreage, in 2016, 2017, 2018, the Montney is in that position today where they have tier one acreage that has not been drilled at all. And you get two benefits, one higher pricing regime and B, they know the technology, they know the best spacing, they know the best sort of uh, fracking equipment to use, the best fracking technologies to use, the oil field service providers, your Schlumberger's, Weatherford's, Halliburton's, have now better pumps, they have better 
uh, pumping equipment, they can drill faster, they can complete faster. It's like hitting the jackpot if you're a monthly producer. Mm -hmm. And what do you have on top of that? You have land that hasn't been developed. So you're not suffering from any, any sort of quality degradation that you see in the Permian, in the Eagle Fur, in the Bakken. Um, so which producers do I like in this area? There's, there's a few producers actually with, with, with what we call virgin land at its highest reservoir pressure. Uh, you have Crew Energy, one of my favorites, really, really good well results. Uh, they're, they're increasing production, they're a growth play. Um, you have your Spartan Delta uh, Corp, which is more of a slower growth play. They bought assets at the cheap during COVID, so you're not paying upfront for this acreage. Uh, you have Kelt Exploration, another sort of high, high growth play. Um, and then you have sort of your, your legacy producers in the area, which are your, your ARC resources, uh, is, is sort of the biggest one right now in the area. And what are we seeing with ARC resources? We're seeing quality degradation. Why? Because ARC resources bought seven generations energy, which capitalized the Montney in 2016. Every shale is the same, but I would rather be in shale companies that have this new tier one acreage, uh, which is why I prefer the crews, the Spartan Deltas, um, the Celts uh, of the world, maybe Pipestone and Hammerhead, a Hammerhead, which is going public, I think in a month on the NASDAQ. So these are all great companies to sort of play, play that. Um, so, so the two sectors on the small to mid caps. And then the third one, which I like to keep very low exposure to, I keep less than 10% of my portfolio at any time will be exposed to these sorts of companies, which will be your junior plays. And why junior plays, you ask? Like, why, why, why are they so attractive? Because from 2010 to 2014, and even earlier, all the way, let's say, going back to 2000, all the junior plays, by the time they got to the retail investor and the small fund, you were paying up for the, for the asset already. You were paying premium pricing. You were paying above what the, what the initial private placements were at because there was so much private equity money dumping money into these private equity, uh, private companies that eventually went public. What's happened in the last couple of years? You're seeing ARC Financial, Canada's biggest private equity firm that funded oil and gas companies has sold off 50 to 60 to 70% of their positions. And they're investing now into solar companies, into renewables. You see companies like, like JOG Capital, for example, another big private equity firm, they sold all their positions, they returned the cash to the shareholders, and they said, we're done, don't call us again. We don't wanna deal with, these, with this climate, with this oil and gas uh, sector ever again. It's just too much. We had our private equity money stuck for so long, we don't wanna deal with it. So what's happened is companies are having a really hard time raising money so they have to raise money at A, lower valuations, and B, they're coming down the food chain into the high net worth individuals and the smaller funds and the smaller family offices, meaning we're seeing opportunities come across the desk, which are stuff that I could not even dream of ever having a chance to invest in, you know, five to seven years ago. Um, now, what makes this even more compelling is that from 2010 to 14, a lot of great, great assets had development plans made. They had engineering studies done. They acquired the acreage and they were getting ready to drill when 2014 happened and the, the bottom fell out of the market. And there was a, there's a select few companies that have been hanging on to this acreage, just praying for the day that oil prices go above $80 a barrel again. And now they're here. These, these plays have been pre-studied. They've been, the geologic studies have been done. The 3D seismic has been done. They hold the land at very attractive royalty rates uh, because they made sweetheart deals during the low, low pricing regime to extend their, their leases. Um, and they're coming out and saying, we already know this prospect is gonna hit oil. It's not an exploration play, it's a development play but you're getting it at sort of that exploration risk reward uh, potential on some of them. So 
um, been really keeping my eye out on these. I've invested in two of these over the last, call it 12 months, um, and, and always on the lookout for more. Uh, we're also invested in some other junior companies that are already public and, and offer this sort of skewed risk reward scenario. Uh, but again, I only expose somewhere between five to 10% of my portfolio to these, because if they hit, I'm sort of looking at a, at a 10 to 20 to possibly a 50 X potential uh, on, on some of these companies. So why, why go, you know, all the way into these companies, if you're getting that, that sort of exposure anyway. Um, and this could be through private placements. This could be through buying them on the public market in blocks. Uh, a lot of shareholders in these companies are tired of it. They're getting older. They just want to sell out their stake and, and move on. Now that the prices have sort of rebounded since 2018, 2019, 2020. Um, so definitely lots of opportunity and very little competition because the private equity funds are gone. A lot of the family offices have shut down and a lot of the, even the high net worth individuals that used to invest in oil are saying, we, we just don't wanna do it. Uh, we, we just want our money back and you can take on the rest of the risk reward and sort of play with it, um, which leads to a very attractive uh, scenario, I think, as, a, as somebody who's willing to deploy capital in, in those junior companies. So three- and my, my, my last question here for you, um, how, how do you get out of this? What, what are you looking for to actually see like a sell point or, or something like that? What are, what are you looking for on, on the exits? Yeah, so uh, a question that I was getting a lot in sort of that April, May, June uh, timeframe. Um, so there's sort of two things that I'm gonna be looking for to exit. One is going to be the companies need to be between six to eight times free cash flow. That's what they need to trade at. And how are they going to get there? Now, I get a lot of pushback on this saying that the companies are never going to get there. You're, you're, you're dreaming. Fair enough. Okay. The companies are going to get there. If the market doesn't get them there, they will pay 20% dividends and they will buy another 10% of their float every year. How long can that really continue for? When you look at the most, the most sort of similar comparison, you look at cigarette companies. What happened was the market started to hate them. Nobody wanted to buy them. These companies started paying out hefty dividends, buying back shares. And what you saw was them, they normalized back to about a nine to 15% free cash flow yield. That equates to six to eight times free cash flow. So we are going to get there. Don't, you know, let's not kid ourselves. If the market isn't going to do it, the companies themselves will. We see they're not serious about going back to that drill, baby drill thing. They don't care for it. So where's the money going to go? The debt has been paid down. Look at the last 18 months and the amount of debt that these companies have paid down. It is an absolutely shocking to see that maybe 10, 20, 30% of these companies are now debt free a commodity producer in oil being debt free mm -hmm. is just unheard of. Uh, you know, previously, if you offered them debt at seven, eight, 10%, they would say, yeah, bring it on, bring it on. We want more uh, higher lines of credits, higher bank lines, more term debt. It's no longer the case. They can't wait to pay back these banks, get them off their back, uh, redeem the, the term debts. So, the, the six to eight times free cash flow is going to be my first sort of um, exit position. And why is it a great exit position in my opinion? Because the people who are gonna sell at those levels are not going to crater the market because there's gonna be natural buyers of the stock. When something pays a 12 to 15% dividend, you're gonna see natural buyers come back in who are not looking for your two, three, five beggar share price appreciation, they're looking for a steady dividend yield, maybe backed up by hedges. So maybe a company hedges half their production at $100 a barrel. That way you pay, pay your dividends, you have your bottom safety net, and then any, anything on top of that uh, goes out as special dividends, which you're seeing these companies do. Companies like Tourmaline, CNRL, Devon, Pioneer, they're paying back as special dividends which brings their total dividend yield between 12 to 15 to 18%. So that's sort of the first thing I'd be watching. 
Uh, the second thing that I personally am quite interested in is that I think the cycle is going to move. Not right now, but in the next six to 12 months, I think there's going to be opportunities from, from my perspective with my background where I would rather invest in drilling my own wells I would rather invest in sort of junior companies that have that same mandate where they want to go out and maybe do some exploration with multi-leg drilling. They want to do some exploration with newer zones, bypass zones. And not every one of these companies is going to be successful. There's going to be companies that fail. There's going to be companies that are legit scams. They will tell you one thing and it's, it's just not true. Um, and then there's going to be companies that hit something that's just an absolute game changer. And you get these five, six, 8,000 barrel a day wells um, that are going to give you that 10 to 15 to, to 40 to 50 X sort of returns on, on investing in these companies. And I think my whole mandate so far has been that the opportunities are not here yet that are that attractive to me, uh, but they're slowly trickling in. And I think with my sort of background, I do want to take advantage of those. So there may come a time where I'm, I might say, look, although I believe in these mid caps to go up another X percent, I just think I need to reallocate my capital into the more junior startup companies um, and, and sort of go from there. And I think my, my experience and my background gives me a little bit of an edge anyway in that. And they always say, invest in what you know best. So, um, you know, my, my personal investment mandate is going to change into those companies. It doesn't mean I'm leaving the oil sector. It just means it's a, it's a reallocation. Uh, I'm willing to be more risky with my, with my uh, capital. But I think on the whole, if companies start trading at 10 times free cash flow, I think I would look to exit sort of the small to mid caps anyway, even if the junior... Uh, opportunities are not there yet. I think that's when we start to get very juiced up valuations. Um, so, you know, maybe for somebody who's not interested in the juniors, uh, that would be my point where I say, you know, it's it's just getting a bit, bit juiced up here. Um, and I would look to possibly make money in, in other sectors um, going forward. All right. Well, do you have anything else that you'd like to add? Kind of in general, that was my last question. But anything that you'd like to add? You know, I mean, you don't have to. But. Um, no, not really. I think I just appreciate the opportunity for being here. I think uh, it's it's important that we that we discuss oil and gas. I know it's a very hated sector, uh, but you know, look at look at the world. It's energy that drives the world. It's energy that drives the quality of life. It's energy that drives everything. So you know, it's it's. We're not doing ourselves a favor. We're not doing society a favor by just taking on wild, you know, wacky theories. You know, I'm I'm not sitting here telling you that that oil is an absolutely rainbows and unicorns. You know, it's it's oil is what it is. We require oil to to run our economies. The developing world deserves oil to get their quality of lives to sort of where where we have it in the Western world. Um, and for us to make you know, fallacies and fantasies about, about this is going to happen or we're going to transition into this and that is just, is just completely wrong. I think it's, it's in fact just, just immoral, I would say. So, you know, having conversations about where oil is, where energy is, where oil, gas, wind, solar, hydrogen, everything plays a role going forward in, um, in our energy mix, I think is very, very important. We, we shouldn't be ignoring the issue. And we shouldn't be throwing mud and stones at, at each other because it's not solving the problem. We have an energy shortage going forward in everything, not just oil. I mean, look at coal prices, look at the prices of some of the renewable electricity that's going out there, right? And um, I, think, I think now is a great time as ever when, when uh, we were sort of in this lull phase, you know, things haven't gone completely out of hand yet. Um, at the same time, we've had these reserves and whatnot to, to kind of get us through this period to really have, have strong conversations with, with not just our neighbors and our friends and families, but with politicians. Hold them accountable for, for what's going on here. You know, for them to just say that it's oil companies are price gouging, 
or that you know we need people to now all of a sudden start drilling again when you told the same people that oil is dead and you're going to put them out of business six months ago you know it's time it's time they take a little bit of accountability and responsibility for what they've 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 done so far and um you know work just work on making making more more access to to reliable energy sources for the world um and and that's kind of where i'll where i'll end it i appreciate you having me on uh, i always love talking oil so if anyone on this you know who's been listening uh, if you made it through the end uh um, of this of this podcast uh, feel free to reach out to me my email is on the website um and then i i hope to see some of you at our at our sunday seminars um there's uh, some exciting stuff i have planned um a couple of junior company seminars followed by a q3 special october 16th and then like i mentioned if you're looking for a absolutely end all be all uh, oil and gas macro outlook uh, october 30th is the date I will forewarn you, these sessions can go on for four, five, six hours. But let's be honest, this is a hundred million barrel a day sector. It is a $10 trillion industry every year. So it, it wouldn't do us any justice to talk about it for 15 minutes and say, uh, you know, oil is this or oil is that. So I, I like to be comprehensive and some people don't like it. But for those that do, uh, I always appreciate your support. and. Um, uh, look forward to seeing you, you there. And uh, yeah, thanks again, Andy. Uh, great chat. Yeah, thank you for coming on. I really appreciate it. Definitely check out his website, check out his Twitter account, subscribe to him. And uh, we really appreciate it. And hopefully we can get you back on. So thank you. Really appreciate yeah, you it. Happy to anytime. Thanks again and uh, have a great rest of the week. Cheers. All right.